Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I'm your host, producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And at the other end of the tin cannon string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from the wide left Substack. He is Mr. Useful Human, Arif Hassan. Arif, after watching the game tonight, I am a little confused because the Vikings have been terrible in the third quarter this year, and mm. that's where they scored most of their points today. Yeah, um, there was a significant conversation about this uh, in the Vikings facility and among Vikings reporters to Kevin O'Connell about their inability to score in the second and third quarter. Um, and the Vikings evidently made a couple of changes to that end. So they brought the offensive coordinator, uh, Wes Phillips, from the uh, booth upstairs all the way down to the sideline. I don't know. I guess that helps. Uh, and then also kind of change the play calling procedure to streamline it. Um, they said simplify the offense, but I don't think they would mean it in the same way as most people would when we say simplify the offense. So um, I think it was more just make the play calling more efficient, more streamlined, be a little bit less um, complicated on that second play call when you like kill the play. Um, so, yeah, I, maybe that played a role. I don't know. But that's nice because the first possession didn't score any points. It was a pick in the red zone. And that felt like, you know, maybe the Vikings kind of have been reliant on those those first points off the first two drives. And that not happening felt kind of significant until they scored like 21 off the rip at the in the second half. Which, not complaining, but it was just odd. Yeah. I, I just after the Vikings had such a terrible start and after it seemed like everything that could go wrong was going wrong for them in the first half, them scoring immediately in the third quarter did raise my eyebrow and I went, what the what what team is this? I don't this isn't what I'm this is absolutely not what I'm used to this year. This team <laughs> what is, do I do with my hands. I, I, What's yeah, going on? I something I complain about often, but I can't complain about. I I they, I appreciate them shutting me up. Good for them. Well, welcome to this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys are all doing well. The Vikings won on a Sunday night. They were able to put the game away and take out the Indianapolis Colts and Joe Flacco. There was a good half of football where that was not looking like the sentence I was going to be saying once we recorded. Yeah, it was like, it's like... Oh, in prime time, the Vikings put away an inferior opponent that they were favored against, covered the spread, uh, and made it uncombackable in the final two drives, essentially. And that is not the feeling that you get coming out of the game having actually watched it, no. right? <laughs> they did not they did not do that. <laughs> like they literally did that, but they didn't, you know, in spirit convey that feeling there was uh, a i saw i saw some fans uh that were not fans of the vikings just like fans of other teams being like hey so this game was like flexed right that's what i heard i heard that they chose to put this game yeah i'm sorry <laughs> we were vikings fans weren't happy about it either believe yeah, me no no one liked this no i i'm not sure if the other game would have been much more fun to watch in the evening but i have to tell you first half not great uh, we'll get more into that in just a moment, but uh, before we start, again, thank you guys so much for listening to Norse Code. If you enjoy the show and would like to help us out financially, you can do so a couple of different ways. You can go over to patreon.com slash Norse Code and help us out there. $3.50 a month or a little less for the year subscription. You get access to the bonus materials, you get access to the Discord, all of that. And, uh, you know, we just put out a new bonus episode here uh, just, I believe, last week. And uh, people seem to have enjoyed it, so check that out over on Patreon. You can also go to paypal.me slash norsecode as well if you'd like to give a one-time donation, or you can go over to norsecode.threadless.com and pick up any number of wonderful Norse Code pieces of merchandise, shirts, baby onesies, uh, we have the uh, the Arif stickers and all that over on Patreon. And because Christmas is coming a lot sooner than any of us would like, uh, we do have the Arif line uh, available for you. So check that out over at norsecode.threadless.com. We're going to do something tonight we haven't done in a while. We are going to be treating this episode like one big mailbag. And 
the first question is more of an overall question, but I'm giving it to Kyle Seagal, who asks, oh, wow, we barely beat the Colts, a team that beat the Bears by less than a full touchdown, the fields, uh, the fields led Steelers by three, and the Titans, and the two Willis Dolphins by three. How is this game not supposed to be a clear hope bait for the final plunge into the abyss? Okay, um... First of all, they beat the Colts by like multiple scores, but I don't actually have a ton of genuine answers to this because the Vikings did not play to the level expected of a five and two team or a team that went undefeated for a little while coming off of a very difficult schedule. Um, So, yeah, I yeah, the Colts aren't a good team. I agree. But the Vikings have beaten very good teams, which I feel like was studiously ignored in the crafting of this question. Yes. Not that I would ever accuse Kyle of writing in a slanted question. No, of course not. That would be that would be uncouth. Why why <laughs> would you suggest such a thing? And really right. it the question the better question that's being asked and somebody had put this in from the mailbag and I appeared to have just forgotten to put it in, but was this game closer? than it appeared or further apart than it appeared. Like the score didn't appear to be an accurate description of what happened here today. I mean, I think, I think it kind of depends on, on how you would kind of adjudicate that. Right. Because from a final statistics perspective, the Vikings were much better. They had uh, substantially more net yards, not even close. They had more yards per play, not particularly close. Um, the Colts offense scored three points like that feels important, right? The Vikings offense scored 21. They also gave up seven of their own. Um, that also feels like, like it doesn't feel close when you describe it in a lot of these ways. But of course, it never felt like the Vikings were in control of the game, which is, I think, what a lot of people would be getting at when they say the score makes it seem further apart than it actually was. And I think that that's fair. Um the Vikings scored in situations that I'm not going to say felt low leverage. There's not really a ton of like low leverage scores, except when the game has already been put away, but it, it, they didn't score in situations that felt like representative of a normal game state. Right. So for, for example, uh, them driving in the two minute drill, which I guess they didn't really score, but, but driving in the two minute drill, um, that's not like a normal game state. Right. Um, them producing off of a short field that doesn't feel like a normal game like so i think that that might be part of it um the fact that the vikings seem to be scrambling to fix their own mistakes more than anything else might have been part of it but the colts didn't play well uh and in fact um they benefited from a bunch of low frequency high variance type events that favored them a lot uh so for example it felt like Sam Darnold was under a lot of pressure, a problem produced by the interior offensive line. And I get why it felt like that. He was sacked four times on 39 dropbacks. That's a sack rate of over 10%. That's obscene. That's really bad. Um, But it turns out the four sacks occurred on essentially 10 pressures. It depends on how you count the pressures. But his pressure rate was below 30%. That's great. The average pressure rate in the NFL is around 33%. So his pressure rate of like 28, 25%, whatever you want to call it, um, that's really good. So the pressure rate's low. It just didn't feel like it, right? The fumble shouldn't have counted. Like I, I do think that the reason that he fumbled the ball was because he was hit in the head, right? Like, I I don't think he would have dropped the ball on the second swipe down had he not been slapped in the face. And there's you can't do that. That's actually not allowed. Um, and uh, they threw a flag. They picked it up. Kevin O'Connell was like, hey, so your guy who threw the flag was totally on point about that. Why did you all pick it up? He was hit in the face. Um, As of recording, I haven't seen anything on my timeline where someone has talked to the reporters. Um, Oh, uh, it actually just got tweeted out eight seconds ago. Let's read it. Thank you, Kevin Seifert, uh, who actually before ESPN moved him back to the Vikings beat was on the rules beat. Like genuinely, he was the point guy for talking about rules. So Of course, he'd be the guy with this. Uh, So question, can you tell me what you saw to originally throw the flag on the Indianapolis fumble return for a touchdown? Smith, what I, so Smith is the is the referee, Sean Smith. What I originally saw was a potential face mask on that high hit on the quarterback. 
Question, what went into deciding to pick it up? Smith, we determined that the initial force was at the shoulder and it was incidental contact to the head and neck area. So they do agree that there was contact to the head and neck area. They say it was incidental. Question, does it matter if it is the forearm or the hands or the helmet that hits in an area? Would a forearm to the head still be considered a blow to the head? Smith, well, I did not see that. Question, was replay assist allowed to help you with that at all? Smith, no, it was not. So this kind of confirms something we saw from last game. Replay assistant cannot add that particular penalty, even though technically replay assist was expanded in 2024 to include unnecessary or um, was it uh, roughing the passer? That's it. And that should be that, but I guess it would actually be an unnecessary roughness penalty, so they can't include that. Um, so the refs just got it wrong again. I, there's not a lot of nuance there that the, there was a forearm to the face mask um, and they just concluded that it was incidental uh, after initial contact at the shoulder, which is not the case. I don't know why replay can't help with that. And um, replay assist not being allowed to help with that is a reference to New York buzzing in and overriding the refs. That's not what I mean by replay not being able to help with that. Like you literally can't challenge that play for whatever reason. Anyway, um, so they were wrong about that. Great. Um, so I think that that was a big progenitor of that fumble. And so they were able to benefit from that. And they not only picked up the fumble, but returned it for a scoop and scores specifically. Like, and that is a very low frequency event. They're a little bit more likely on quarterback fumbles, but it's still a pretty low frequency event. So I think the Colts benefited a lot from what was procedurally not bad play from the Vikings, but impactfully was punished really heavily when it occurred. So I think that's part of it is that we're used to sacks occurring on about 20% of pressures. These occurred at twice that rate. We're used to fumbles, you know, not always being returned. This one was. So yeah, I, I think that the Vikings actually did substantially outplay the Colts. It just doesn't feel like it because every time the Vikings made a mistake, they were heavily punished. It does feel like that, and it's odd. And that play in particular with the uh, that ended up being the fumble and, and running it back for six, it really just felt like it's legal to smack Sam Darnold across the face. Like at this point, there's no like you might get fined for it a little bit, but you're getting points out of it. Nine points over the past two weeks. Yeah. And in a game ender on on the previous week, so you got the two points. And they but just it, released yeah. the fine. <laughs> they just released the fine for the Rams, and it was a like pretty low. It, like there was a there was an eleven thousand dollar fine for a player who like twisted uh, Justin Herbert's leg, which is bad. I agree, you should get a fine for that. That feels low. There was eleven thousand dollar fine for a player who I guess imitated a gun. That feels really high, honestly. <laughs> Um, and that's weird that those are equivalent, but like twisting someone's leg increases the risk of injury substantially. And that's why you would find it. This fine, I think was $7,000 if I remember correctly or about, and Isn't it there also just a dartboard. It feels like it, um, twisting someone's head. I, I would argue it does create a pretty substantial risk of an injury. I don't know why that fine would be different. My understanding is that fines are not pegged to player salaries. If they are, then uh, that would be the reason. But what the hell? That's that's a low fine. Yeah. I feel like they, in some way, should be pegged to the person's salary. Like, I'm just... And and I I can't I don't know the, what what he's making right now for the for the for the Lions or not Lions for the um for the Rams, but that's you ended the game with it. Is all I'm saying. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Let's uh let's go to our next question, which is uh, from Joey, who asks, "How did Darnold miss the memo that we look for Addison on every play so his free three post doesn't create a panic?" Uh, specifically on that uh, interception. Yeah, that second interception. Um, so yeah, he was staring down Justin Jefferson, which I know that like Vikings fans um, have said, hey, "You got to throw it to Jefferson when he's even when he's covered." Um, like he's so good and like, yeah, what they, what they're really communicating. So I'm not correcting them because I understand what they're actually communicating, which is your threshold for Joeing, throwing, throwing, throwing to Jefferson is a little bit lower 
than your threshold for throwing to anybody else. And so you should be comfortable with tighter coverage when you're throwing to him, especially in gotta have it situations like that one. Um, but that's not what that means. No one wanted that. He was essentially triple covered. I mean, he was double covered, but there were three Colts in that area. Um, and I, I don't understand kind of what, cause he was staring him down, right? Like that's like, I think that's the other thing is that one, he's staring down Jefferson, which the offense is designed to enable him to do that, but he should have moved off of Jefferson to Addison who actually should be second in that progression, if I understand the way that that play is designed, who should be second in that progression um, or should be an alert because it is a post against a single high. And so actually you should just snap your eyes to Addison quickly after holding the safety to Jefferson. Um, Either way, Addison is wide open, throw it to Addison. That probably is a touchdown. If it's not, you get the first down that you're looking for Um, and a huge gain. And that should be it. Um, so yeah, I don't really know what that's about. I mean, Addison did get a fair amount of touches in this game, so he probably shouldn't be that upset. He got 42 yards, five targets. He also had a run for nine yards. Great. Uh, plus a touchdown. Um, but it would have been nice if he had like 40 more yards than that or 50 and a TD and a touchdown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Zach Dixon asks, what kind of unflagged headshot will Darnold take next game? that will somehow result in an, in an even worse outcome. Uh, Ted said that uh, sniper shot from 4,000 yards. I, okay, that's funny. <laughs> um, wouldn't 4,000 yards like set kind of a sniper record? Hold on, let me, let's find this one out. <laughs> this sniper is, record. This is important. This is the sort of thing that you come to Norse Code for, is uh, Arif typing and Googling uh, sniper <laughs> shot records. Very close. So the longest confirmed i don't know if it says confirmed um okay i'll just go to wikipedia instead of google that's that's not helpful um confirmed kills of 12 of 13 1370 yards or greater um it is ukraine okay which guess which war that one is um 4156 yards so as of november 2023 we actually have had a sniper shot confirmed kill of over 4000 yards but that's pretty new. 2017 um, was the last record, 3,871 yards. So 4,000 would be really impressive. I think we got to wait until at least week 12, 13 yeah, before that happens. I mean, that's basically the, that's the sniper equivalent of, hit, of hitting a 61-yarder. Yeah, it's – yeah, you, we got we to gotta wait – I mean, it's kind of a 65 yarder, if we're being honest. Well, um, well, no, because if if, if you hit 4,000, it's a 61. If you hit the 4,100 and whatever, then you hit the record. Like it's it's re- so close to the record. Saying 66 is the record, that would be a 65. I think yeah. it's impressive. So uh, I think that in next week it'll be he'll be sliding, and as he's sliding. He's going to take one to the dome. Didn't he just get one of those like a game prior? Yes, but here's the way that that outcome is worse. Okay. And there was no call. Right. Here's the way this outcome is worse. He gets a game ending concussion. Okay. I I see what you're saying. All right. Yeah. And so that's uncalled game ending concussion alters the course of the game. Um, So that's that's how that gets worse. And then by week 14, we could start talking about record setting cyber shots. I actually, I'm kind of, I don't know, maybe proud's the wrong word, but like surprised that I was right that 4,000 was near the record. <laughs> I do not look up sniper records very frequently. <laughs> <laughs> it was an educated guess, educated wish, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> Andy asks, are Sam Darnold's three turnovers, two interceptions and one fumble, in the game, a major concern or something that is unlikely to reoccur in the future. Side note, uh, he uh, afterwards he was talking about that he wasn't banged up, he wasn't injured at all. He was kind of moving around a little funny. He was moving funny, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's kind of curious. So, uh, Darnold, um, well, we can just look it up on, on uh, PFF right now. Might as well. I mean, I'm already looking stuff up, right? You're already looking um, up sniper records, so and we're only yeah, might as well about, look up something football related. We're only about 20 minutes into the episode, and we're already looking up sniper records. So yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it must be a record. Um, yeah. So his turnover worthy play rate is right now at about his career average. His career average is four percent. 
Um, but it's weighted by the first two years he was with the Jets, both at 4.4%. Beyond that, he was closer to like 3.7. And so right now, his turnover-worthy play rate, not including this game, is 3.3%. That is heavily influenced by the last three weeks where he had a really high turnover-worthy play rate. Um, So that, or last four weeks, actually. Um, So I think that there is something to be concerned about, but he actually has fewer turnover worthy plays on average in a game this year than what he had in this game. But yes, that's something to be concerned about at the beginning of the year. Some of his turnover worthy plays weren't really being punished. The, it, at closer to now they were getting punished at a somewhat higher than normal frequency. All of them were punished in this game. So I don't think that he will continue to do it at this rate, but it'll be close enough at this rate that we're probably, you know, splitting hairs here. So yeah, that is a concern. Arif Mettenberger asks for Arif's PTSD corner. Am I a fake fan if I turn the game off whenever things are going poorly? I can only handle visibly seeing one Sam Darnold pick per game. Okay, so avoidance is a pretty normal reaction if you have PTSD. Um, so I hesitate to say that you're a fake fan because you're engaging in typical behaviors associated with this mental health condition. Um, but yeah, no, you're a fake fan. You gotta, you gotta take on the trauma. That's, uh, this doesn't apply to anything in real life, please. But you gotta, the part of the fandom is absorbing and embracing the trauma. That's it. Yeah. It's uh, it's a bit like that uh, that Blizzard in '91 that everybody likes to talk about. I've never heard of that. What are you talking about? Oh, have you never? Oh, we'll, we'll talk after. It'll be fun. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, Tracy asks, how many more times do we have to see our center get bowled over on a passing down before we get a new one that will also let us down? <laughs> Last good center was probably Joe Berger and then John Sullivan, right? So, and Joe Berger was kind of an accident. Yeah. Um, been a bit. Uh, so and then Matt Burke, he went to Harvard <laughs> and then he ran for office. We won't talk about that. Um, uh, mm, probably, probably a number more times. The Vikings like this guy a lot. Uh, so on that play and he got absolutely steamrolled, not close. On that play, he was in a rare moment where he was one-on-one against a defensive tackle, I think on a four-person rush. I don't think that that particular play had a blitz, if I remember correctly. Um, That doesn't happen that often. On four-person rushes, he usually gets help. I think, I haven't rewatched the sack, I think the Vikings were giving Cam Robinson a little bit more help. Sometimes we saw that in the form of like chips or double teams from the tight end. Uh, Sometimes we saw it with a guard moving over to help him. And if Blake Brandell is helping him, he's not helping Garrett Bradbury. And if the strength of the defense is aligned to that side, Bradbury is just going to be on his own because Ingram has his own problems to deal with now. Uh, So I think that might be what happened. That's kind of more speculation without rewatching it. Um, And we haven't seen Bradbury as much do that this year as we have seen in other years, I guess is the most optimistic way to put it. But the Vikings love this guy, so we're probably going to be seeing it for a while. Probably three more years. Sorry. Lurking asks a, uh, a related question. Is Garrett Bradbury more of a revolving door or a turnstile? I say turnstile because revolving doors at least reroute you a little bit. Well, they both kind of suggest, uh, you know, the appearance of an obstacle that are overcome in different ways. And I think a revolving door, pretty easy to get around, turnstile, pretty easy to get through. Uh, And certainly in this game, it was much more of a turnstile. Um, You know, you push the bar, the bar goes down, you go forward. That's exactly what happened here. But there are games where he is a revolving door. Um, I think that more often he gets uh, pushed over. So... Uh, most of the time he identifies as a turnstile. Sometimes he'll identify as a revolving door, and we just have to respect that. It's his identity. Jack Rackham asks, "How explain how Darnold can mostly play very sharp and then throw the worst interceptions we've ever seen. When Darnold goes Darnold, he goes full Darnold. Yeah. Uh, he is 
Very interesting. Um, I, he, he is who we've been told he was going to be, but he's also been better than we've been told right. he was going to be. Right. He's a better version of the guy he's always been, I guess is the best way to put it. His good plays are good. His bad plays are the same. Um, so I think what's occurring here is that Darnold doesn't have a lot of situational awareness, but he's got pretty decent spatial awareness which I did not expect, you know, from his New York Jets days. And that spatial awareness has given him the latitude to move around in the pocket a little bit more, which he likes to do. He's always kind of liked to do that a little bit and do it more effectively. But he doesn't really always know kind of what the goal is. And not having situational awareness um, can create problems like you take a sack to get out of field goal range, which I think did happen in this game. Or... You throw it short on third down when you're not going to go for it on fourth down. Or you take a sack when you actually could have thrown it short on third down. And that would have put you into field goal range, which did occur, I think, on the second to last drive. Uh, There's just like a, yeah, it was the Cam Akers drive. Uh, It turns out, actually, Cam Akers was open on that final third down. And no, he wouldn't have gotten the conversion, but you would have gotten into field goal range and that would have helped. Um, I think that he doesn't have a ton of situational awareness and he plays the same. Luckily... That style of play does kind of work for two-minute drills. It just doesn't work super well for four-minute drills uh, because it's very, you know, aggressive. Uh, So I think that that's kind of part of it. And he's pretty clued in to the ways he wants to be aggressive and how to accomplish that. But sometimes he doesn't. I don't know, man. Like, I think one thing to think of, like, think about it like this. The amount of focus it takes to be a quarterback is immense. It's crazy. Um, if I asked you to like count to 2000 and I wanted you every single time you counted to a new number to focus on like the contours of the numerals, right? Look at the curve in the one, look at the serif in the two and contemplate it by about, I mean, it depends on who you are by about number 27 or whatever, you're skipping. You're like moving along quicker. You're not focusing on the individual number. It's just really hard to do from number to number to number. And that's kind of what we're asking quarterbacks to do. And occasionally he's just going to lose focus. He's just going to, whoops, I guess that's a pick now. That's just kind of who he is. It's really difficult. It's a really high level skill that's really difficult to train, really difficult to find, and he doesn't have it. And so he's just going to make some mistakes. But when he's locked in, it's pretty good. He has some amazing moments, but boy. <laughs> this, but yeah, you're uh, paying for him. You're paying for him. Yeah, you are. You are absolutely paying for him. Will Melvin asks, now that TJ Hawkinson is back, how long will it be until we see a Josh Oliver 100-yard game? <laughs> <laughs> Did he have five receptions in this game, I want to say? Because like, the broadcast was like, wow, he's got four receptions, and that was before his final touchdown. Let's find a, Let's take a look. Five receptions, five targets, 58 yards, 11.6 per reception. Perfect. Um, yeah, I mean, he cut, for him, he went off, right? I, is this a, we're going to look this up because we're live. Um, live. Uh, this is going to be like the likely and Mark Andrews situation where Mark Andrews came back and likely is like, yeah, I'm, I'm just getting these now. <laughs> I'm going to score touchdowns on your bench. This is his second best game in terms of total receiving yardage. This is actually really funny. So his best game, 76 yards for Baltimore. Who else? It's just some random blocking tight end just goes off one day. Uh, so he had 76 yards. His five next best games are all with the Vikings. 47, 33, 32, 31, 30. All with the Vikings. The only been with the Vikings for like a season and some games. Um, and then this is, uh, this is added onto the list as like, his best game in a Vikings uniform from a receiving total receiving yardage perspective. So yeah, this is the Vikings have been using him in the passing game much more than Jacksonville or Baltimore ever did. Mm -hmm. And the Baltimore game, by the way, was a revenge game. He was playing Jacksonville. So maybe that's why. Um, But yeah, no, uh, I think probably the next week we'll see Oliver go off for 70 plus. Maybe, maybe 85. I've, I've, I've over under is somewhere around 79.5. Right. Uh, yeah. If you see that on FanDuel, like, you know, you ham- have to do. hammer that. Uh, also from Will Melvin, is Cam Akers the running back uh, two moving forward or will the Vikings roll with three runners? I think he's probably running back two. That looked pretty good. 
Um, he got some really good blocking on that drive. Um, you know, I don't want to overstate it. I'm still kind of suspicious because he's been historically like since, especially since his second injury, but since his Achilles injuries been just less successful. Um, the way Kevin O'Connell talks about him, he like admires him like and his character, which is great. But that doesn't make him like a good running back. We've also seen Ty Chandler have a couple of good yards per carry games and rip off a couple of big ones on um, relatively good blocking. I don't think that that's going to be there. Um, we did see him take, you know, the the wrong gap uh, on that drive once. Um, so I'm not confident that, that it's genuinely good, but I do think the Vikings think so. So, yeah, he's probably running back too. Cam Akers is actually just going to be coming out during like the beginning of the second half. Like that's <laughs> that's those points be, for sure. I, yeah, look that he, he was successful. He was fresh around the second uh, around the midpoint of that third quarter. He was breaking some serious runs that had me confused. I was like, "You're gonna yeah. keep feeding Cam Akers? All right, yeah, hurry yeah, up!" Aaron Jones had twenty one attempts and only had sixty four yards, which I was really considering taking him in a couple of these pickums. I didn't take him in any, so I feel pretty happy about that, but I would have been sweating had I taken the over or the under because it was like, I think it was at 76, but if you told me he got 21 attempts, I'd be like, oh yeah, he's hitting the over. So he didn't. Um, I think Aaron Jones played well, by the way. You know, He only averaged three yards a carry. He played well, but we're not seeing that in the box score. And of course, Cam Akers averaged 7.7 per carry. So it just feels a lot better. And if we're talking about Aaron Jones, we have to talk about how the end of the game went. Because a lot of the yardage at the end of that uh, end of the fourth quarter was as a result of Aaron Jones plowing through and finally like in putting it out of the hands of the Colts. Yeah, that was great. I, I was doing like a little recap to help write my story and Aaron Jones just snapped off a bunch of runs. What is it? 10 yards, 7 yards, 2 yards, 6 yards, timeout, minus 1 yard, play action pass to Josh Oliver for a touchdown. Like, okay, yeah. Uh, g- I, good game, Aaron Jones. Like, I genuinely, it's a really good 3 yards carry. He also had a couple of receptions. I think his longest was like 22 yards or something like that. Um, didn't get the blocking he wanted on a couple of these screens, so his reception total isn't as great, but... He had a good game. It's just like not in the box score. Was it four for four for 18 yards with a long of 22? That's really funny. <laughs> uh, question from Andrew Schaefer. Is Aaron Jones the the Vikings best interior pass blocker? Oh, my God. Um, I, I still think it's Blake Brandell. He did not have a great game as a pass protector. Pretty good as a run blocker. I, I think normally it's Blake Brandell. But yeah, no, yeah, that's fair. Uh, fair question. It's it's rough. Uh, ben asks, how was, we got a, we have a combined thing here. Uh, ben asks, how was Anthony Richardson able to avoid looking smug as Flacco struggled tonight? <laughs> and draw play uh, Dave asks, what would, uh, what have, what would have been Anthony Richardson's stat line in this game? Had he played instead? And so Joe Flacco was 16 for 27, the 179 yards, uh, for 6.6 yards and attempt and a 59.3 completion rate. Um, I think, uh, Anthony Richardson would have been, so he's 16 for 27. Um, Richardson probably would have been 10 for 27 for 200 yards, Uh, (laughs) 37% completion rate, um, 7.4 yards per attempt and, uh, how many picks 20 yards per completion, uh, two touchdowns, two picks. I think they get teased with a third. Like they get the third, but it gets called back. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. Like something, something dumb happens and all that, which is which we can trans use to transition to Flacco, who the I, I, I was. It's not that I was shocked to hear that Tony Dungy said something stupid in the pregame. I oh wasn't. my god, what did he say? What I wasn't. I wasn't shocked. Uh. But Tony Dungy was, I believe it was Tony Dungy. If it wasn't, it was the other uh, gentleman who chose uh, to pick the Colts tonight. But the, he said the idea was to get the running game going right away and they're going to have success there and that's why they're going to win the game. The next thing that's said, on the, that's said in, the, in the pregame was by someone else, someone else who said, 
They have the best like run defense in the league. Like this is not going to be a good day for the Colts if they're trying to run the ball. Like if they have success, oh yeah, they're going to win the game. But like that's not something that you can count on. Yeah, I I don't think Tony Dungy pays attention anymore. No, he he, he doesn't. <laughs> have, he's just, not paid to. But just right. between between the run game getting stuffed often and the defense confusing Flacco this was a uh, this was a good game for the defense Flacco had trouble but they couldn't get to him until the very end of the game when it was just Sac City yeah that was crazy um so uh let me take a look at because I, I did grab it at halftime so at halftime Vikings were getting a pressure rate of about 25 percent um so obviously it was like pretty low uh, and uh, the Vikings weren't getting, um, I think, any sacks at halftime. I think all of the sacks came in the second half, um, which, okay, sure. Um, but we did get to see uh, a bunch of pressures appear, or not a bunch of pressures, a bunch of sacks appear at the end of the game um, after, uh, I think it was, what, like 30 dropbacks, all three sacks occurring in the final drive, Jonathan Grenard with the sack, Jahad Ward with the sack, and then Jonathan Grenard with the second sack, uh, which, good for him. Um yeah, great, but there wasn't a ton of pressure. And that's kind of annoying because the Colts were playing with a backup left tackle. We talked about this in the interview about like they'll probably try to help him. But, you know, Matt Gonsalves is just not as good as uh, Bernhard Ryman, who was on the concussion protocol. Uh, so they, they couldn't get through and Flacco was able to get rid of the ball really quickly. His um, average time to throw on non-pressure passes was 2.39 seconds. It was blisteringly fast like 2.5 is pretty quick um 2.39 is is extremely fast Uh, and for uh the total in this game it looks like it was 2.59 period for the entire for all of his dropbacks so a really quick time to throw for flacco uh which obviated a lot of the pressure but it would have been nice to see a little bit more pressure even knowing that the ball was coming out really 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 quickly and this is a problem that the vikings have been Dealing with which is that um, they are giving up the ball, or they are they are giving up chunk gains on these really quick throws. It pro- you probably remember it worse than it actually was uh, on unpressured throws. Again, when he's averaging two point three nine seconds per throw on unpressured throws, he only averaged six point three yards per attempt. He only averaged a fifty four point five percent completion rate. It wasn't happening that often, but I, it is still something to kind of be aware of that the Vikings are kind of giving some of these up. Plus, I mean, like there's that, like, was there two pass interferences? Certainly there was a late one with Stefan Gilmore that was kind of annoying that helped them out a lot too. So also something to keep in mind. Yeah. At the, uh, at the very end of the, well, it was the one that put them in position to kick their final field goal. Right. Because they wanted to set up before they hail married at the end, I guess is the whole deal. Yeah. Or- well, Kind of, and they well, need they needed two scores, and one of them needed to be a field goal, so they took that one. And then, yeah, yeah. I did laugh a bit looking at the lineup for special teams for the Vikings because there's a lot of money on that special teams. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but it was like a pretty critical, and it turns out the guy with the best hands in the world was the one who caught it. So of course, I get I get it, but yeah, that's <laughs> very you never yeah. you never see that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was trying to explain to uh, I was trying to explain to Jenna and I was like, yeah, like you never see the guy who's making I believe the most or like second most uh, in the league as a wide receiver <laughs> on special teams. This is usually where guys are like, you know, cu- working their chops and like getting up to the point of like playing on offense or defense. Like, oh yeah, nope, Justin Jefferson, T.J. Hawkinson, T.J. just back from injury, just you know. For the love of, the, they're just back there for the love of the game. That's that's all. Uh, let's go to Sean, who has an important question. With Reichard looking injured and his status unclear, what potential free agent kickers would even be worth investing in at this point? I mean, there's a there's been a lot of kicker injuries, as anyone in the hell league can attest to. Yes, this is accurate. <laughs> What a what a wonderful week for the Hell League. Let me just say, with all of the kicks, I I, I disagree. Uh, <laughs> you're beating me in the original Hell League at the moment. But right, so uh, I have both uh, Tyler Bass and Cameron Dicker on a couple. Of, okay, so Tyler Bass <laughs> made up for it. 
But I have you two did. kickers who missed extra points among my three Hell League teams. Uh, Cameron Dicker did not make up for it. Tyler Bass ended up making up for it by like he nailed a 61 yarder, which gives you Buko points in this league uh, and a couple of other field goals. So that was nice. But man, I got and I think I got a. I think I think I also had a third kicker who missed an extra point. I think because I think on I, one of your teams, you have the Seattle kicker. Yeah, yeah. So both kickers. So Cameron Dicker and whoever the Seattle kicker is both missed extra points. I was just out of that contest. I was just it was done. Um, so we had a lot of misses. We have a lot of injuries among kickers. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, I'm going to Google free agents. I'm, this is a Google friendly episode, right? Reichard was, um, Reichard was clearly in pain and not just cause they like announced it to the, to the audience through Chris Collinsworth. Like he was clearly limping. I was a little surprised they didn't just go for two on their final touchdown because they knew that Reichard was going to have to kick, was going to have to kick off. Like I was a little yeah. surprised they didn't just go for it there. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder like what the conversation with him was about that, uh, about like whether or not he'd be comfortable kicking and stuff like that. Now, let me take a look at the free agents right now. So Spot Track is currently filtering and sorting by position. Let me take a second. Are we thinking a little possible hamstring? I, got, I mean, I mean, the way he was moving that, I mean, that does seem right. Yeah. The, uh, the kind of like jump up and limp afterwards seemed to me that it was a screaming, a hamstring thing or like, you know, using heat for it, not necessarily a quad injury, but I guess we'll see. Okay. The two available kickers that spot track has are like Randy Bullock and Riley Patterson, former Viking Riley Patterson. Um, if you don't remember, Riley Patterson was cut in camp. That's probably why you don't remember yes. if, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a not good. <laughs> this is not that good. Uh, I mean, certainly the there's there are a bunch of free agent kickers. I mean, they go through camps and stuff like that for a reason, but yeah, it's not good. <laughs> no, it's, and for somebody who's been as consistent as Will Reichert has been, the first kick was, an aberration. The second one was, well, the, the doink, uh, the thong, uh, that one really, and he's hurt obviously now. So it makes a little bit more sense, but that one was troubling. That's a 31 yarder. That one you're expected. I don't think John Parker Romo. Yeah. He's not on a team, so you might be able to, he was in camp, right? So you might be able to sign him, I guess. You probably don't want to, though. He hasn't made an NFL team, but he was in camp, so he's somebody the Vikings know. <laughs> this, That's at, all I got. At this point, uh, any port in a storm. Yeah, otherwise it's Randy Bullock. That's, yep, just so have fun. <laughs> you know what? I would, if he makes a game winner, I would consider getting a Randy Bullock jersey for the three <laughs> weeks that he's on the team while right They're not even, covers. there's no, they wouldn't even put it in the store. You'd have to get a custom. I would have, I would buy the custom Randy Bullock <laughs> just so people could ask me who the hell was Bullock. I was like, oh, he was a kicker on the Vikings in 2024 for three weeks. <laughs> while uh, while while real while Will Reichard was uh, was on IR, it was four weeks. But it's like, yeah, that that's it was, it was a wonderful season. Thank you, Randy Bullock. Be fantastic. I th- I think the funnier thing is someone recognizes that the only person in football whose, whose name is Bullock is Randy Bullock, and so they're like, "Wait, why are you wearing a Randy Bullock Vikings jersey? What are you?" T-? And you have to like tell them like, actually, he did play for the team. For, yeah. Like, four hot weeks be fan that's, that's if you're gonna get a jersey if you're gonna wear another man's name on your back on the back of your jersey he better be someone you really respect be be one of the greatest of all times or it better be a wonderful one-off <laughs> right yeah exactly <laughs> like cj ham there's a story there but if you're gonna go all out you know you you get the gerhardt jersey for no good reason or you get the um what was the one that was at the live show uh, Old Dominion's greatest quarterback, uh, Taylor Heineke. Yeah, you get the, you get the Heineke yeah. jersey. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's where you're at. Old Dominion's greatest quarterback. <laughs> that's how I remember him. Well, yeah, that's he's 
It's either <laughs> it's either that or a case cookus one. Actually, that might be worth it. I might need to use show funds to buy a new jersey this year. We'll see. Uh, ben Greenhagen asks, Cam Robinson and Cam Akers played well against the Colts. Are there any other Cams that the Vikings can trade for before the deadline? They already got Cam Darnold. What more do you need? Oh, that's... And they've got Cam Bynum, who would have had a pick. He would have. That was a dumb, dumb penalty. Before we yeah. transition into some of the not uh, Vikings questions here... Let's go over just a couple of things because, as you had tweeted out, this was a quiet 100-plus yard game for Justin Jefferson, who now, I believe, is either tied or surpasses Adam Thielen for number four overall uh, for yards. Uh, for yardage as, the, as the broadcast was ending, they said he's one yard away from tying Adam Thielen. Okay. So, Jefferson, good game. And was able to get often uh, open. Yeah, I mean, pretty typical of him. Um, so 137 yards plus 22 yards passing. Can't ignore that. What <laughs> a play. Yeah. What a dumb play that worked. It Like, they keep doing it. They keep doing the throwback, usually to Jefferson. Jefferson throws it to someone else, and it ne- it doesn't work. Never works. This one worked kind of against all odds. Didn't look like it should have worked. Okay, fine. Please stop. Please, you, you got did it. it once. <laughs> it finally worked. We're good. Dude, it's on film now. Now they got to watch out for it or whatever. <laughs> Just stop doing it. <laughs> They've seen what it looks like when it's successful. Never do that again. Yeah. Okay. Like the thing is, like I don't mind that play, like in the abstract. But it has never worked for the Vikings. Like, they've tried it like three, four times this year. It has never worked, except this one time when very clearly it shouldn't have. Like, very obviously, based off of what happened, that was not the most likely outcome. So, stop it. It's a fine play, kind of, in general, especially because Jefferson can throw pretty well, and he's going to attract a lot of attention when he has the ball. I get it. But for whatever reason you can't do it, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> but he can throw the ball too. <laughs> because if you, you get if You know you, you know what the throws, better throw to catch combination is? It's not the one where he's throwing it. I'm just, I'm just putting that out there. Look, there a lot was said, a lot of ink was spilled over the offseason about how he's the highest paid non-quarterback in the league. And maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's stuck in his craw a little bit. So so they were doing this to get him to stop talking about okay yeah, great this fine is, he's got he's got his pass attempt yeah it's, let's it's, get it's out of the here stefan diggs thing i'm never the bigger person <laughs> that's that's such a fire quote i'm gl- <laughs> like he keeps on talking about like how much he's matured how much he's moved past it and he's done with it he's like no i'm not gonna you know what no i'm never the bigger person i love how his quotes just lend themselves to tattoos they're so good man there's truth to all rumors. What a great tattoo. <laughs> I'm never the bigger person. That should be in like old English block type <laughs> yeah. on somebody's shoulders. That's what that should be. Um, but yeah, Jefferson, great game, was moving around. Great, uh, was, was looking well, yeah, good. So, and Naylor so, as well. Yeah, so Jefferson, 137 yards, fantastic. A lot of it occurred near the end of the first half, which did not produce points, whatever. Um, fantastic. Uh, really great 41 yard catch when the Vikings noticed like, Hey, you're in single coverage for some reason. And, uh, guess what? That's dumb. Here's why. Great. But the bigger impact he had on the game genuinely like, yeah, 137 yards. That's fantastic. It's hard to have a bigger impact than that. The bigger impact he had on the game was so obviously and clearly pulling coverage away. This is one of the few instances where like the broadcast, like, beat a quote to death and they weren't really wrong to do it that he can change the weather quote which is a great quote until the fourth time you hear it yeah um but like that was the reason that josh oliver was getting open so often that jalen naylor had gotten open that often that jordan addison had gotten open like it's very clearly jefferson is just just it just has gravity right in like and he's like he's moving mass towards him right and As a product of that, we got to see a lot more space available for Jalen Naylor, for Jordan Addison, for Josh Oliver, 
on occasion, TJ Hawkinson, who we may have heard of. Um, yeah. And, and that doesn't take away from the game that Jalen Naylor had. I thought the touchdown he ran was excellent. The Vikings did have to hold on to the ball a little bit longer for that touchdown to play out, but it was good. It, the fact that he was running along the goal line instead of getting into the end zone and getting into the detritus of all the defenders, that's pretty good route running. Um, in like relatively speaking, like pretty good patience. So I thought that he did a good job. I, I was a little bit confused to see um, like Brandon Powell out there a little bit more often, um, Trent Sherfield out there a little bit more often until I kind of saw what else they were doing with Trent Sherfield and I kind of got it. Uh, Sherfield was just blocking like linebackers and defensive ends a lot, not on his own, but he was like part of that. And it's like, you know what? Yeah, I'd rather he do that than Jalen Naylor. I guess I see why he's on the field. Like Cam Robinson's gonna is dealing with some stuff. Help him out. Great. And you reward Sherfield with like, you know, a reception. Great. Good job. Uh, but as a pure receiver, it's pretty clear that Jalen Naylor's better. And we're seeing a lot of that play out. And I really like, you know, the way that he kind of generates a lot of separation bursting out of his his route stem he's like very good at those intermediate routes so great game but a lot of it a lot of it is jefferson just just moving the colts towards him by a sheer force of will which is awesome to see yeah this is this is everything you want from your number one receiver absolutely this is the sort of thing that he is he's paid for. <laughs> he is he is not just the target, but he is the one that causes the defense to go, what on earth are we gonna do against him? Yeah. And the moment that he had that one on one. They they just punished him. They're like, oh, All right, that's well, your funeral. <laughs> I, I remember just like seeing like I like because they they hadn't shown uh, that they hadn't shown that there was no real safety help. It just looked like there was no safety help when they when he went off and it was one on one. And I just remember going, "Oh, that's not going to go good for any." There it goes. Like <laughs> you, yeah. you can't it's just you can't do that to him. He will punish you all day long. It's glorious. Yeah, I love it. It's just so nice to have that <laughs> something you can hold your hat on as a Vikings fan. Yeah, if you if you put Justin Jefferson in single coverage, he's going to get it. 98% of the time. It's great. Uh, as far as the defense was concerned, the defense did uh, pretty well against the, uh, against the, the Ra- or say the Ravens, good Lord, against the Colts. Well, it was Flacco. And so that was my first thought. The, the, sure. Uh, to making sure that Flacco was not elite today. Uh, any specific performances on the Vikings defense that we should talk about? Uh, Harrison Smith, was able to break up a couple of uh, big passes, uh, including that massive third down. Yeah, I think um, I was actually going to mention Harrison Smith as like the highlight. What's interesting is that he did not start the game, you know, very well. You know, he immediately gives up a reception. He's um, the single high safety. His job is to take on this inbreaker, uh, and he loses a contested catch opportunity. Um, I think it's to Josh Downs, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, and that's like pretty early in the game. And you're like, ah, man, is he getting old? I don't know. And then he has, after that, like the game of his life. It was fantastic. Um, So uh, I thought he did a really great job, especially obviously in that final drive, but just generally throughout the game, he did a really good job of, you know, closing down on coverage, providing that safety help, you know, really punishing people from going over the middle. Uh, I thought that, because I think, did he only give up the one reception, I think, in coverage? Uh, If so... Interesting to do that at the very beginning of the game and then not ever have to do it again. Um, but yeah, uh, he didn't have like a ton of, I, I don't think he had like a ton of like total tackles or anything like that. Okay, he was targeted five times in coverage and, and technically he gave up four receptions, but one of them was the was the um, 22 yarder. Uh, yeah, I thought that he had a really good game. Um, so there's that. Um, I thought that he played well. Cam Bynum played well. Again, would have been nice for him to get the pick, but you know he did not allow a reception as far as I could tell. Um, so that was pretty good. Josh Metellus played a pretty good game. Obviously not as impactful as he was in the first three games, but a pretty good game. I really liked his play. Uh, was pretty good um, You know, rushing the passer too. He was party to one of the sacks. Great. Um, the Vikings did not play linebackers that much because they played Andrew Van Ginkle as an off-ball linebacker pretty often, uh, and they put him in really difficult spots. 
And I think that if you graded Van Ginkel as an off-ball linebacker, you probably would not come away impressed. But kind of curving that grade for the fact that he's an edge rusher, I think that he did a pretty good job because Ivan Pace goes out for a couple of snaps. So you don't have Blake Cashman. You don't have Ivan Pace. You've got Kermit Grugier Hill. You've got Andrew Van Ginkle. What are you going to do? And Van Ginkle did all right. You know, he technically doesn't allow anybody in coverage. He does like, um, I think he misses a tackle in, um, in, uh, as, as a, as a coverage defender. And he seems like he's out of position on occasion, but for the most part, I think that he did a pretty good job moving around. Dallas Turner got a couple more snaps in this game. It seemed like, uh, he did a pretty good job when he was dropping into coverage. He moved really well in coverage, kind of weird. Um, but it was nice to see him. He got a little bit more run. I think that's because of the Ivan Pace injury and moving, you know, Van Ginkle around, which Ivan Pace did return. So, you know, that it didn't seem like that's a kind of long-term concern or anything like that. But yeah, I think we got a lot out of that. I didn't see Shaquille Griffin attacked at all. That, that seems relevant. That's good, right? Um, he probably played 20-odd snaps out of the, um, out of like the 35-ish coverage snaps. Uh, so he was on the field fairly often. Um, yeah, I think that, I think that the defense overall, you know, we didn't get as much out of the, the front four as we would have. Harrison Phillips had a great game as a run defender, by the way. I think this time he actually has the tackle stats to back it up. So, um, you know, you don't have to like reach or anything for it. Uh, but the only good pass rusher was probably Jonathan Grenard. I mean, we saw the Jihad Ward sack. That was nice. We saw Pat Jones get pretty good pressure on occasion, but I think for the most part, the pass rush just wasn't there. I talked about the pressure rate early on. Um, but we did see uh, some pretty great run defense from um, from Harrison Phillips, who I thought um, not only got like the first tackle of the game and a, and a couple of, of tackles in the backfield, but also just really ruined a lot of days for those interior offensive linemen and was a big part of the reason that Jonathan Taylor really couldn't get very much going up front. Uh, let's go to the less football oriented section of the mailbag, including a question from goggles FTW who asks, now that we are bowl eligible, what are the chances the Vikings end up eating a giant living pop tart? (laughs) Better than Uh, they were 24 hours ago. Yeah. um, The pop tart bowl is not one of the better bowls. So and the Vikings right now are on the path to one of the better bowls. So I'm going to say the odds are relatively low, but certainly, like you said, better than 24 hours ago. Exactly. Uh, Kenneth Allen asks, for a Reef's chrononmancy corner? Sure. It sounds like time magic. Let's just say that it is. Yeah. Uh, What magic did Kevin O'Connell use to successfully break the cycle of 2016 that loomed large tonight, and how might his spell reverberate beyond tonight's game? Um, Okay, so I just want to be clear. Magic's not real, and this is not a podcast that covers magic um but probably now that the moon is in a new phase uh, <laughs> i mean probably cast a spell tied to the lunar cycles which means that in a couple of weeks we're going to see another downturn and hopefully uh he I, mean, I assume that he looked at the lunar charts before he did this hopefully when we get to the playoffs we don't have to worry about a down phase or the down phase occurs during bye weeks or something like that uh and so we might kind of thread a needle here and um, avoid, you know, a waning gibbous for the Super Bowl. Someone looked that up. I'm sure. Sure. I'm not going to do it. I'm sure the waning <laughs> gibbous cycle is not during the Super Bowl. What are the odds? What are the odds, Reef? Uh, I mean, you could Google it, but we're, but you're not going to. Uh, yeah. Larissa asks, do you think they will ever make it so you can't ever have any head contact when tackling? As a rugby person, every time I see someone get their head hit, I get angry because it's just an ineffective way to tackle. Okay, so uh, yes and no. I, the, I, it is just the existence of helmets. Like I, Having helmets makes it so that you have the hardest possible surface to hit someone with. And yeah, in football, the primary thing is to take down the opposing ball carrier so he doesn't gain yards. But you also are trying to do damage. And sometimes you need stopping power more than you need wrapping up. Uh, and you generate more stopping power with your hard-sided helmet. Uh, so um, 
and they're not going to get rid of helmets. They kind of just aren't. Um, I, I think that you're never going to be able to remove them for offensive or defensive linemen. And if there are players on the field with helmets, that means all of them have helmets. So I think it's just when, what's going to happen. Um, and I think the fact that being able to rock someone backwards is such an important part of the game and doing damage is such an important part of the game that lowering your head to spear people is just kind of natural, especially because you do need to lower your center of mass to be an effective tackler. Obviously in rugby, it's a bunch of shoulder tackles. uh, And so it's possible to do that without making contact with the head. But when you're already there and you've got the ability to just kind of level someone, you're probably just going to take it. So and I don't know that they'll ever make it illegal. Certainly they are legislating a bunch of types of it away, but I don't think they're ever going to be able to like get rid of it because everyone's trying to get low all the time. And so there's just going to be helmet contact. I wonder, well, since we're mentioning helmet contact, I'd like to bring up a certain ejection that happened today involving Puka Nakua punching a Seahawk helmet. And that being an inge- being an ejectable offense. Now I get the whole you know throwing a punch thing, right? But punching a helmet. Uh, I mean, at, at some point. Okay, so first of all, like you, you probably should just have the blanket rule of of ejection for a punch. I so I think that that's a good idea. Were you to make an exception, and it's someone punching a helmet where they are least likely to do damage to others and more likely to do damage to themselves, I can see why you do that. But there are a lot of rules in there to protect people from themselves too, and that would probably fall in that category. And also, like I think a lot of people are okay with some rules because it punishes stupidity, right? Like there are a number of people who do like the fumble out of the back of the end zone rule. I mean, I hate it. But a lot of people like it. We should use the, we should use that as like a way of profiling them. <laughs> profiling people who like the rule. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm n- I'm not going to wade into that one. <laughs> not not that you're wrong, James. But to get to the point that I'm getting to, it's people like that rule because it punishes stupidity or bad behavior. Hold on to the ball. Having the ball near the end zone is the most important thing you could do. Hold on to the ball. Now, they don't seem to like apply that to when the fumble rolls out of bounds and it retains the offense, so I don't know. But they don't like the idea that you can fumble and score, which I kind of agree with. Um, And they also don't like it when you propose putting the ball at the one on those fumbles. I don't actually know why that is. Um, But it's, oh, it's stupid. Hold on to the ball. Don't be stupid. Uh, Okay, that's kind of the thing here. Uh, Probably don't punch someone in the helmet. That's stupid. Now you're being punished for being stupid. So that's kind of it. Mm. I saw it helped me. I had I had Cooper Cup in a lot of my pickums, which again, read my piece on why you shouldn't do pickums. Don't do it. <laughs> but I did it and it worked out. But that's not results not typical. For anybody who missed last episode, there's a wonderful anecdote, and you should listen to it for two reasons. One, the pronunciation of the uh, of the Houston kicker, whose name I will never pronounce again. And the second well, You did one, so well and I, flawlessly and uh on beat. Yeah, that was one of my better efforts. It was um, very smooth with no interruptions. No, that was one of my better efforts that happened mostly after the episode was recorded. But um, yeah, it was like, there was that and there was a, a lovely discussion that Arif had about his gambling piece in which immediately after he posted this gambling piece, he ended up getting an offer and in his piece, he described how he's had to turn money down from these organizations. And it's it was the most brilliant yeah, just, piece of, you just tell me you didn't read the article. Yeah, yeah. Just listen to the anecdote at the end of the last episode. It's very, <laughs> it's very funny. It's a, uh, it's a very good episode. But uh, let's go to Skimble Shanks, the railway cat, who asks, who asks, which Ed has caused more harm to the world, Ingram or Gein? Jesus. Um... Okay. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the concerns people had about Ed Ingram before the draft, uh, which unfortunately gets closer to leveling the playing field on this one. Uh, but it's the, it's the human skin suit guy. That's the guy. That's the worst. But I could see why you would ask that question. 
He's very frustrating. Did not have as bad of a game as Twitter is saying. It was bad. I'm not saying it wasn't. It was actually more of a problem as a run blocker, but it wasn't as bad as people are saying. But I think the guy who like made land, Mike, did I get the right serial killer? I, he's the human skin guy, right? He is, yes. Okay, yeah, it's not the turning lamps into uh, turning people into lamps. That guy, not that guy. I mean, that guy's if, worse. It, yeah, that's it's it's a hard to be on his level, but I wouldn't say his play tonight. Got right, him. I get where you're coming from with the question. Yeah. Is what I'm saying. It's uh, it's it's closer than we we'd feel comfortable with. Uh, let's go to Eli. And the only reason I'm putting this in here is because somehow we got like three questions on Japanese culture and Godzilla. Um, we're not answering a sumo question today. I broke Arif's heart by telling him that we weren't doing it tonight. So Arif not only didn't see the question, but he didn't uh, get a chance to research it either, which in my mind means it's okay to not ask. But Eli asks for a reef's Japanese media corner with the Vikings playing on Godzilla Day, which current Vikings players can best be compared to famous Godzilla Kaiju. Okay, I um, was told we weren't doing this question and that you were just mad that everybody asked it. So now that I'm at a point where I have to answer the question, I don't really have a great answer. I guess uh, Grenard is probably just Godzilla. Um Former Viking Daniil Hunter is probably Mecha Godzilla. Um, I don't think we have a Mothra, right? That, that doesn't seem right. Is that a, uh, is that Van Ginkel? Oh, I like that actually. That's good. Okay, um, Mothra has like a beam, right? Like or not a beam, like a little like circles come out. It doesn't matter. Um, let's see. I'm not going to do Space Godzilla. That one's stupid. Uh, I mean, most of these are stupid, if we're being honest. That's kind of the appeal. <laughs> Mecha Godzilla is kind of an interesting thing. By the way... Okay, how about... Oh, uh, the uh, Hidora, the pollution one. Um, I think that one just causing a mess. I think it's Josh Metellus. I think he just screws up everybody's plans. <laughs> that, um, it might be Ed Ingram. And I just sent you a tweet uh, no. that came from Krauser who explains that uh, he believes that Bradbury got blown up on the strip sack because he stepped on Ingram's foot and lost his balance. Get out. That's amazing. That how, how can he cause sacks that he didn't even cause? That's crazy. That's all Ingram's foot does. It's, it's amazing. It, how, why? How does this keep happening? It, like, I don't, <laughs> I'm clicking on the tweet now. And, okay, it's got a video, and oh my god, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, that's where we're at. I like, don't like this. He... I don't like this reality. Like, the whole deal with his job is footwork. That is so much of his job. And it, it just, they just go everywhere, man. All the time. I, I, mm. Yeah. Let's go to Don from Ohio, who asks, which team outside of Cleveland regrets giving their quarterback the big money contract? Green Bay, Jacksonville, or Miami? Oh, my gosh. Uh, probably Jacksonville, but... They, okay, the they thing were is, going to give money to him regardless. Well, that doesn't mean they wouldn't regret having done it, right? Um like, it was inevitable, but that doesn't mean they can't be sad that they did it. I feel like <laughs> Miami's the better answer because, like, for, for like, regret's sake. Like, oh, yeah, I forgot that his hits to the head are finally going to, like, become or, or could potentially become an issue again. Like, he had one season where that wasn't an issue, and then it just popped up immediately after he signed a check. Yeah, okay, so, like... I, my opinion is that Trevor Lawrence is probably the best out of those three. And I know Tua's statistics are just like much better. Maybe not this year, but are just like much better. And then Jordan Love had that great end of the season. 
Um, but I'm like totally bought into what film nerd Twitter keeps saying when they defend this guy. And even though it's never appearing on the field and he threw that infuriating pick in the end zone at the end of the game, which I don't like, why are you picking a linebacker versus running back matchup in the end zone when your tight end who I may or may not have had in a pick uh, or five um, when your tight end is wide, you don't need all of the yards. This guy is wide open for like five cheap, easy yards and you targeted him 10 times in that game. What is wrong with the 11th? Why is your backup, backup running back that your target against this? Like, I in the end zone, I, I, what do you, okay, anyway, Trevor Lawrence is still probably the better of these quarterbacks, but it is infuriating. And I can see why you'd regret that more. Tua, I think that's one where you regret it because you could see, that issue popping up again, but he was just so productive that you, you, you know that you're taking a chance. Like, you know, the gamble that you're making, uh, Jordan love. I think they still just believe in him, So I don't think they regret that one, No, but yeah, yet soon. Do you Wait. feel like the Packers and bears were exposed today? No. Um, maybe the bears a little bit because like they were kind of, riding this like short-lived wave um, of Caleb Williams playing really well. Uh, if you were looking and- for a schedule to make a rookie quarterback feel comfortable, they hit for like the first half of the year, they hit it. Unfortunately, their back half is atrocious. Yeah. Uh, and so I think, so I think like if we use the term exposed to mean other teams now have the blueprint, no. I, that's that's going to keep on happening. If we use the term exposed to say that the public is now getting closer to the correct opinion, yeah, then maybe. I don't think the Packers were exposed. The Lions might be the best team in football. Maybe it's maybe a little bit of that is copium. Like, oh, one of the two teams the Vikings lost to is the best team in football. And they were really close. Um, but, I mean, they, they're outstanding, and they dominated the, the Packers uh, up front, both sides of the ball. Um, but I don't know, like, I don't know that the Packers were really like exposed yet. Like, I think that we're going to have to wait. The Packers will be exposed. Obviously that's the official stance of this podcast, but I don't think this game was it, even though it was pretty embarrassing. My theory is that, well, it's, it, it's not some sort of a secret that I think that the bears and the Packers are much worse than their record would indicate. Um, just based on who they've beaten this year. But just the fact that they were able, that they were handled so easily today, um, I I particularly enjoyed. I guess my other question is, uh, is Detroit dirty? We've had this uh, question in years past, especially last year, and it's rearing I its actually, ugly head uh, again to this year. Did something happen in this Packers game that would suggest that they're dirty? If so, I missed it. Yes. Well, in addition to that, uh, in addition to what you could say was a very, uh, was the the play that led to the ejection, there was also uh, the twisting of ankles of of Jordan Love and everything that that also happened during the game. Oh, okay. I see that now Um, because I looked up Lions Dirty on Twitter, the everything app. Sorry, X, the everything app. No, um, Twitter. We don't we don't refer to it as X in this uh in this I, house. I think calling it the everything app undercuts. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> like it's kind of the because like when I looked at it, I saw uh a head to head hit which felt not incidental, but not like evidence of dirtiness. But now I see the ankle twisting, which I actually did miss live because I was watching like five games at once. Um so that's not good. Like, okay, yeah, Brian Branch gets ejected. That felt week, like a lot. Week in, when week he got out. Ejected? Well, the the reasoning from the reasoning from the refs uh, and the reasoning from New York was that he had every opportunity to correct his head and he didn't. He this was like multiple steps into it, uh, into the tackle, and that's when he lowered his head into uh, into the uh, into the receiver. It's that, it's tough. I hate looking at um at slow motion replays to determine that. Maybe 
Um, I don't like, has Brian Branch been accused of that before? I don't, I don't think he has been. Um, is there a team called, like I would have said the lions were dirty in the Dominic Raiola and Dominic Sue days. And oh, I think absolutely. Sue got, and you would be, it, you'd, it would be hard for you to be called wrong there. Yeah. And, and what really sucks is that Sue got, I'm not going to say a bad rap because he was a dirty player. Like that's just true. But it was like over, like people used too much evidence and half the evidence was bad and we could have just used the other half. But Dominic Raiola just sucked. Like there's no question about that. Um, and maybe it's because I'm comparing it to specifically previous Lions teams and how obviously dirty they were that this, the Lions team just doesn't feel that dirty. <laughs> and maybe that's not fair. But like, I don't think Kirby Joseph did any of that on purpose, period, ever. I don't think that happened. And when we eliminate that from our, uh, calculus. There's, I don't think there's a ton of evidence. Like, yeah, I'm seeing the twisting ankle. That's a dirty play. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to deny that. But for a team to be dirty, it would have to be persistent. And I haven't seen, I've seen accusations that are persistent. I haven't seen persistently dirty play. Nobody's uh, out there stomping on quarterbacks' hands or anything. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yet. Or arms or faces. A lot of stomping in those days. A lot of stomping. Uh, Don from Ohio also asks, for James and Arif's concert etiquette corner, what's the most annoying thing to happen when you are in a standing room general admission floor seating? Number one, concert goer next to you complains about the band during their songs. Number two, concert goer next to you does not shower or put on deodorant for a week prior to the concert. Or three, concert goer tries to push their way ahead of you to watch the band. Okay, so obviously all of these are obnoxious. So I'm not saying none of them are. Um, all of them are. I think the – it depends on the concert you go to. It, it, some concerts, the not showering thing is like kind of normal. Um, or the concert is so like active – that it doesn't matter and it's just going to end up smelling. Been to a couple of concerts like that. Um, so that number two is not going to be as annoying, but there are some concerts where it's only the one person. And for whatever reason, that's way more annoying when it's just the one person. So that's my number one at some concerts and my number three at other concerts, if that makes sense. The shoving to the front is obnoxious, but I don't think that that's up there with the person next to you bitching the whole time. That sucks. No, my... My thing is, um, as as a hill giant, I'm sure you can sympathize with this. Right. I usually just let people in front of me. You know, I'm I'm trying to. If I go a little bit further back, it's not going to bother me that much. There's a point in which I'm going to go. Okay, I'm I'm too far back. But for the most part, I'm going to be standing there and be okay, and let people kind of you know breeze by. Uh, the deodorant thing bothers me. Uh. I'm going to go with uh, with the fourth option, which is the guy next to you has taken a bit too many mushrooms and is uh, trying to take phone, trying to take videos on his phone of the concert, but is doing them in selfie mode and is videotaping him oh, singing the songs to his phone. Oh, that's bad. Oh, my God. I, I had that's described brutal. that on the show after the uh, uh, after the nine inch the second nine inch nails concert and at yeah. Red Rocks when the when the guy who did too many mushrooms and then the mushrooms overtook him and he was uh, he he came one with them. he came one <laughs> with the bench and uh, <laughs> last I heard security at Red Rocks was dealing with him so that uh, that fish dude took uh, one one or two too many grams uh, let's go to Jesse from Brooklyn. Who asks, my life is a, or my, rather, my wife is a lifelong Patriots fan, but now that we're married and the Patriots suck, she's been dabbling in Vikings fandom. I took her to the Vikings bar here in New York City. We have a new one uh, with, with a far less passive aggressive DJ. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> I love that part of the story. Uh, and she couldn't understand why we're all so pessimistic about our new team. I tried to explain to her the likes of Gary Anderson, Blair Walsh, 41 Donut, 38.7, but she still can't seem to unlearn the Brady will just save us mentality. What can I show her slash tell her uh, about that will break through this unfounded optimism? 
and plunge her into grief alongside me, just like every good marriage should be. Jesse, right. I this is top. This is absolutely top notch work. What you were trying to do for your marriage, right? Um, sure. So first of all, my condolences that you lived with a Patriots fan and to you, and then my condolences to your wife that she's becoming a Vikings fan. I feel like this is she experienced happiness and you never did and now it's your job to make sure she doesn't and that's marriage marriage yes. um yeah um, if you didn't say it i it, was going to right um i you know i think that so normally it is evil and also murder uh to cut the brakes to a car right but here's the deal you're gonna be the one driving the car <laughs> she's just in it with you I think that I'm probably confident that's a crime. <laughs> oh, it, it is. It's just like it's just a little different. No, it's certainly a crime. It's just no, a, a different classification. Right. It feels a different kind of evil than to like your wife has a car, you have a car, you cut your the brakes to your wife's car, right? That's like that's like a murder off screen. You're too much of a coward to even confront it, right? Like, okay, great. But it's your own car and you take her somewhere that's that's a totally different class and she's realizing that the brakes are cut there's nothing you can do about it as you're approaching an intersection and you're in there with her you're in this together it's bad no one knows the brakes are cut unless you tell her which don't do that that's going to ruin the illusion it's just bad and the thing is the when you don't know what's wrong are right, astonishing when, when you don't know what's wrong with the car it feels like when you're spinning out, maybe there's a way to like get around this, steer out of it, whatever. So you can't tell her that you cut the brakes. Schroden, so she's going to keep believing. Brakes. Yeah. She's going to keep believing until the end when the belief isn't going to help you anymore. Do you have a less deadly version of what I said? Um, uh, watch, have her sit down and watch the, the, secret base video series and uh with oh, you. no that's better actually that makes that's better than mine <laughs> that's, yeah that um that will have you catch charges uh far later in your uh, <laughs> yeah. in your marriage you know my original answer when i saw this uh in our email uh was have her watch the 2009 game with us right when we when we recorded oh, yeah. our 2009 nfc championship but I think actually the secret base one's probably better. Uh, but we could always use the download, so you do that anyway. Yeah, just <laughs> but then put on secret base. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just you can watch the episode while listening to the while listening to the podcast. It's great. Uh, Winston Talk Sports asks for the podcast tonight. My friends and I have been going uh, have been having an ongoing debate: should the Ghostbusters be classified as first responders? Okay, James has a lot of thoughts, which is why he's going to go second, but. Um, I asked James before the show, like, hey, can you clarify something for me? So uh, one of the kind of the running bits that uh, of like a modern interpretation to Ghostbusters is that the EPA was probably right to be mad at the Ghostbusters, even though they're depicted as evil throughout the movie. The, for 80s, trying to shut down. the 80s EPA had problems with what they were doing. Think about that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it must have been catastrophic. Uh, and I would imagine the energy demands of containing ghosts yeah it's it's pretty significant so i was just asking james like did they get into legal trouble for imitating emergency services by using us because they used a siren like that's just illegal <laughs> um no one seemed to have a problem with that and maybe they didn't use a siren and i'm confusing that with the song but i think they did um if no one stopped them it feels like everyone just kind of recognizes that that is Probably fair. It's probably fair that they were using a siren to get to ghost emergencies. Um, and the thing is, most ghost emergencies were not actually timely emergencies, right? Like um, the library. What's the green instance, dickhead's name? Well, the yeah. library. The library instance. Uh, library instance uh, specifically. You had Slimer in the hotel. Slimer. That's it. Yeah, Slimer in the hotel. Not a huge emergency, but also most police calls and even most fire calls are not emergencies. So that's actually not the category of 
evaluation we should use. Some of them are emergencies, and that's enough. I think they're emergency services. So I am going to agree, but for different reasons. Great. That's uh, even better. Uh, so Ghostbusters should be classified as first responders because funeral home directors and uh, people who work oh in, my in the funeral are considered, uh, the death industry is considered first responders. Okay. I know why you know that, but it is stupid that you do anyway. <laughs> We we're just talking about marriage. Uh, <laughs> as COVID-19 showed us uh, in the classification of people that were able to get their uh, shots uh, right away as far as as part of like first responders, the death industry was right at the top of the list. So uh, that as makes sense, I guess the thing wouldn't. Um, it's a lot of dead bodies. And you don't know if. You got, and they got they, you have to let them get to work. Yep. It, it's kind of the problem. First and and in constant <laughs> contact of all these things. Plus, when yeah. you get the when you were getting the body in as well, there was a lot of uh, interesting right. research coming out about what was happening and all the changes you had to do uh, behind the scenes to make sure this wouldn't spread uh, from yeah. the. Yeah, I I am cursed with knowledge as somebody who was. Um, in a quote unquote marriage with a uh, with a funeral. Uh, hey, wait, 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 why why quote unquote? What's, we're what's not we're not covering it this episode, but there was. It just a feels like the thing I said the, the last mailbox. episode is correct. Though. A mailbag question saying. did come up as to whether <laughs> could you tell the story, and I went not yet. <laughs> we're not doing this. You know, but we're not. Uh, we're no, not I know. Covering I'm, just, it. I'm just saying the thing I said the last episode about. The marriage to that marriage. It feels like we're correct again here. We're, we're, we're building up to something. I promise you. <laughs> we're building up to something. But in any case, that would be my argument as to why they should be classified as first responders. However, final question of the episode. Arif Luenza asks for Arif's musical theater corner. Given that the musical six is the most appropriate show to compare to James's life. <laughs> <laughs> what Broadway show must clo most closely aligns with yours? I was not familiar with the musical six until I Googled it. Uh, Arif, can you explain what the musical six is about? Uh, I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining this for the listeners to get the point. It's about the six wives of Henry VIII. Yes, it is all about <laughs> them. <laughs> it's all about his exes in a manner of speaking, singing on stage about their, uh, their time with the main character. Yeah. So, I get it, but I don't like it. <laughs> but I'm not going to say it needs to be cats or anything. You're right. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, elite question is all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my answer is not on Broadway yet and is still in concept album stage. It is going crazy viral on like TikTok and YouTube shorts, especially TikTok. And I think on Tumblr. Um, it's called Epic the Musical and it's about Odysseus and I just feel like I've, I've been through enough to identify with Odysseus that's where you're at you're identifying I, with Odysseus you, I, am I wrong am I it's not been 20 years it's been two but I feel like hey I've had to sacrifice some crew members <laughs> uh, I've had to fight and a you're witch not, and you're not just referring to Dusty okay right yeah, so we're, I think we're here. I think we're good. Um, Epic the Musical, which, by the way, I'm like also obsessed with. I, it's really good. Uh, again, not an actual musical yet, just albums, but it's pretty good. I asked Chat GPT before the show, oh, no. can you give me a summary and a name for a musical about someone that has their Kia car stolen and a few song titles? What? The uh, name of the musical, Car Napped. Carnapped follows the story of Arif, an enthusiastic young adult who loves their quality oh, key. Young. Oh, at least I'm young. Yeah. Throughout the vibrant musical, Arif's life takes an unexpected turn when their beloved car is stolen, leading them on a comedic and heartfelt adventure. With the help mm. of quirky friends, a love interest who shares a passion for cars, and a bumbling what? detective, Arif sets oh. out to reclaim their vehicle. And let me tell you how bumbling this detective is. <laughs> He's one of the car thieves. 
<laughs> yes, actually. That's how that works out. Along the way, they discover the importance of community, friendship, and self-discovery, all while navigating a world where every twist and turn hits a high note. So Sorry, just- did ChatGPT say, say, say that I discover the importance of self-discovery? Um, not sp- – well, yes, actually. I think it did. Yes. Okay. That is literally what happened. I love it. Uh, no notes, ChatGPT. Suggested song titles. Kicking the Tires. Stolen Dreams. Oh, God. Oh, no. The Great Escape from the... S- <laughs> okay. From, it says from the parking lot, but let's um, let's just have this be uh, from the um, from the tow lot. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's fi- close enough. Yeah. Find My Ride. Driving <laughs> on Empty Without You. Keys to oh. My Heart. Mm-hmm. Chase the Thief. And Carpool Karaoke, The Reunion. I'm going to tell you something after the show that you're going to find extremely funny related to that. <laughs> Unfortunately, that can, it cannot be in the show. Uh, <laughs> this musical combines comedy, drama, and catchy tunes to entertain audiences of all ages. I I, I, I can test that framing. I don't think that's entertaining, <laughs> that's, actually. You don't think Carnap is the next big thing? Okay, so one problem with this musical, the car seemingly only gets stolen once. So that's the first thing. Jot that down. Well, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> like, well, first of all, how things are possible through Christ to jot that down. <laughs> it, nowhere in this does it say that's a plot twist. It's it's that you're just giving away like parts of the story at this point. You're the bad trailer. This is the good trailer. This is the good, <laughs> this is the good trailer that doesn't tell you, oh, it gets stolen a second time. That's, uh, to me, that's, that's where the, the all ending, is lost moment. That's, that's the carpool karaoke, the reunion portion. No, that's got, that can't be, we can't have it end on a tragedy. Jesus. Uh, I think that's the all is lost moment. I think the first theft is the, you know, reluctant call to action for the hero or whatever it's called, right? The hero has to, which I assume, let's, okay, I'm being kind of liberal with the word hero. In this context, it means protagonist, <laughs> right? I'm not, there are no heroes in this story. Driving okay. on empty, in quotations. So that, that one's you. good. Okay. By the way, I did have to drive on what is functionally empty, not fuel, but coolant, um, before any of these thefts, right? I told the story on the podcast before, right? Yes. Okay, so that's like one of the pro- – so that actually does work really well. The car did stall on the highway, That which, you know, lovely. I love that for me. Um, for people who like have not listened to any of this before, uh, I had an awful car. It was even worse than I thought. It got stolen twice, one time by the cops. You're going to have to catch up somehow. There you go. Um, yeah, uh, I don't like this. I – I think this is the next great thing. And Minneapolis being uh, such a great musical theater town, I feel like I could uh, I could bounce this around to a couple people. Yeah, I bet. This is, this is pretty good. I bet good. you could. Yeah, no, sure. That is the end of this episode. What do you have to plug, Mr. Arif? Uh, I'm going to get my Colts review piece up for this game. Uh, it's already like half written, so it should be up pretty soon. Uh, and, uh, Luke wrote a piece about like why Anthony Richardson was benched, uh, probably more curious question after this game. <laughs> uh, so check that out. I think it's pretty revealing as to like why you just couldn't play with him and why Joe Flacco as limited as he is, was a better option for the Colts for this game. Uh, and also I've got a very long piece. I invested a lot of time and energy into about why the fantasy and gambling industry is even more predatory than you would imagine from the phrase, the gambling and fantasy industry. Uh, It was a ton of work. I really loved doing it. There's a really funny story about that at the end of the last episode. Uh, And um, it was even worse, way worse than I thought. Everybody that I like had read the story beforehand already did not like the industry. They thought it was evil going in and they're like, whoa, that is way worse than I thought. So check that out. That's over at wideleft.football. So that is going to be the end of this episode of Norse Code. Hope you have enjoyed it. We will be back on Thursday to discuss the the Jags game that uh, they'll be coming up on Sunday. So for Reef, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. 
And please remember, where's my tab here? Please remember that uh, you're driving on empty without you. Or I should go the great escape from the from the parking lot. Either way, we will see you on Thursday. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Reef Hassan of... And he can be found on Twitter at Arifasan NFL. I am your producer and host, and my name is James Vygoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at NorseCodeDN, or at my personal account, at Big Mono. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can do so in a couple of different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash NorseCode and donate there. For $3.50 a month, you get bonus material and more. You can also go to paypal.me slash norsecode for a one-time donation, or you can go to norsecode.threadless.com and pick up some Norse Code merch. Any questions or comments that cannot fit in a tweet can be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. Hey, all things are possible through the power of Ben DiNucci. 